saved you this morning. Let me hear you shout amen. Hallelujah. He's alive today. Amen. Praise God. Welcome to Christian Center. What a delight it is to celebrate a risen Savior and to know that he is among us. Welcome to Palm Sunday. And we are delighted to have you in the house today. If this is your first time here, welcome home. We greet you. We love you. Part of the family you are. And we believe this is a day that's going to change your life. Amen. Why don't you give our first-time guests a good round of applause this morning. Welcome them into the house of the Lord. I am so excited about today, this week, what the Lord is going to be doing on this probably the most important week on the calendar and the history of the world. So we invite you, please, just join all of the activities Friday night with our Good Friday and, of course, Sunday morning as we celebrate the risen Savior together. Invite your family, invite your friends. I believe God's going to save souls. Amen. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful weekend. So welcome. We're so glad you're here. Amen. Glad to see you this morning. Um, I do, I do want to remind you as well, Saturday is going to be a celebration homegoing of our brother John Gaines who has gone home to be with the Lord and he's shouting in the midst of the presence of God and all of the faithful men and women throughout history. Amen. Brother Gaines has joined that multitude and uh, Saturday 12 p.m. is going to be a viewing. 1 p.m. is going to be the service and uh, we invite you just come and support uh, Sister Gaines and her family as we just celebrate this great man of God and we just pray for the peace and the comfort of God over this home and this family. And I know she would appreciate your prayers as well. Amen. Praise God. I get excited about Palm Sunday. Not just because of the palm branches. I get excited because the same Jesus who came into Jerusalem has walked into this place here today. I know that. I didn't come to go through the motions of having church and and I didn't come just to preach a little sermon to you. I came with what I feel is a word from the Lord for you. I mean that. And I pray the Holy Spirit allows me to say, say this word in the way that he wants me to say it. And I pray that you can look past my flaws, my insufficiency, and that today you would see Jesus for who he is. That's my prayer. Because I'm flesh, I'm human, I make mistakes. Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. I'm flawed, but he's perfect. My vocabulary is limited, but he's the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. And his word is never going to pass away. In fact, his word will not return void. And I believe today as his word goes forth, it will achieve exactly what the Lord wants it to achieve if you will open your heart and hear what he has to say. Will you do that with me together? Let's do it as we stand and turn to the book of Matthew chapter number 21. The gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter is where we are going. Matthew should be a very easy book to find. If you can find the end of the Old Testament, then you're going to find the beginning of the New. And Matthew is the author that begins that New Testament. Matthew chapter number 21. Of course, this is familiar territory. It is Palm Sunday. You would expect me to go uh, nowhere else in the Scripture except the Palm Sunday Scripture. But as I read it this week, something came out to me that I had not realized or seen nor ever preached before. So I'm going to preach it to you for the very first time. Matthew chapter number 21. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1. Thank you for standing out of honor of the word of the Lord. We do so out of respect for that. Matthew 21 and verse 1. If you have it, say amen. Now, when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethany at the Mount of Olives, the Jesus sent two of his disciples and said, Go to the village opposite, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me, and if anybody says anything to you, then just say, the Lord has need of him or them, and immediately he will send him. And all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly, sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples, verse 6 says, did, they went and they did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the donkey and the colt and laid their clothes on him and set Jesus, or set him on them, and a... 
very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees, spread them on the road. And the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out and said, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. And they said, verse 10, who is this? And the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. And then verse 12 said, Jesus went into the temple of God and he drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said, it's written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then, I love the wording of the Holy Spirit, after Jesus had done that, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Amen. Praise God. I'm preaching today on this thought as part of our Come Alive series, a release from religion. Come alive from the spirit of religion. We've come alive from the spirit of rejection. We've come alive from the spirit of doubt. Today, we're coming alive from the spirit of religion. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Here we are, Palm Sunday, the day we enter the most holy week of the entire calendar. Events this week that literally transformed the world. And culminating in that day that Jesus hung on the cross Friday, and he said, it is finished that moment of time in which our redemption was secured. And then Sunday morning, the power of the Holy Ghost came upon him, and he came out of the grave, and he proved to the world that he is victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Aren't you glad we win today? Amen. We win because of him. And there's a lot to celebrate this week. A lot happened throughout the next eight days. But today is Palm Sunday. Today is the beginning of all of these events. Today is the commencement of the week that literally transformed the world. So as I prayed over this service and I read over the passage that describes the events of Palm Sunday, reading over how they cried Hosanna, spreading the clothes, spreading the palm leaves, waving, worshiping as Jesus descended out of the Mount of Olives, and into the city of Jerusalem, I was drawn to something in the passage that I'd seen before but never really thought about. And I'm going to tell you today that this is the most unconventional Palm Sunday message I have ever preached. This is the most non-traditional Palm Sunday message I have ever preached. But I feel as though it is the word that I believe came from the heart of God into my heart that I need to share with you today. Because you see, the next eight days marks Jesus' last days on this earth. He is about to institute the ordinance of the Last Supper with his disciples. He's going to wash their feet, showing us the example of humility and servitude. He's going to be betrayed by his closest friend into the hand of sinners. Peter, the most adamant of all the 12 disciples, is going to curse. He's going to swear. He's going to declare that he knows not who Jesus is. The Lord is going to be scourged by the Romans. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be spit upon. He's going to be laughed at. On his bloody back is going to be placed a purple robe, mocking his claim to be the king of the Jews. On his head is going to be a fake crown of thorns that is going to dig deeply into his brow. He's going to suffer the most painful, torturous death known to mankind, that being the crucifixion of a Roman and then three days later, the Holy Spirit is going to breathe into that lifeless body. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come up out of that borrowed tomb. And he's going to declare that he is King of kings and he is Lord of lords. A lot is going to happen over the next eight days as we celebrate what Jesus has done. 
But this is the day that it all begins. This is the day that all of those events hang its hinge upon the day we call Palm Sunday, the day that Jesus makes this grand entrance into Jerusalem. He is making an entrance into the most religious city in the history of mankind. Not only was it the most, it is now even to this day the most religious city in the history of mankind, Jerusalem. Many religions find their source and claim Jerusalem as their home. But I say this, that as I looked that it was very significant in verse 12, that as Jesus went into Jerusalem, what is the first thing that he does? The Bible said that he goes to the temple. And as he goes to the temple, he begins to drive out the money changers and those of the religious establishment. I believe that this entry into Jerusalem is more than just a public relations moment for the ministry of Jesus. It is more than just a publicity stint. It is not a trick. Jesus didn't need the accolades or the applause or the pat on the back. He didn't even, let me tell you this, he didn't even need the praise of those who's lined up on the roadside and took palm branches and waved and they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus didn't even need their praise. And the reason I say that is because when the Pharisees tried to quiet those worshipers, what did Jesus say? He said, if they're quiet, the rocks themselves are going to cry out. Can I tell you something, friend? Jesus is going to be worshipped whether you worship him or not. Whether, you're lay, whether your hands are silent and your voice is quiet, Jesus is going to get praise simply because he is the son of God and he is king of all kings. He wasn't looking for the applause. He wasn't looking for the accolades or the pat on the back. Jesus is entering into Jerusalem more than just a physical entrance. I believe it is symbolic of a spiritual entrance of a new era and a new season and a new dispensation that the world has never experienced before. I want you to hear me on this. As he came in riding on the colt of an ass, the colt of a donkey, he is not physically just entering into Jerusalem, but rather he is ushering in something that the world has never experienced. I believe that the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem is the entrance, the entrance of an age of grace that is breaking from the, from the, from the tradition and from the dispensation of law. And as Jesus comes in, I believe it is on purpose that he went to the temple. Because you see, in the temple, it is Passover. city is packed, not just with the Jews of Jerusalem, but three to 400,000 additional Jews have come into Jerusalem for the Passover. And the money changers are sitting outside in the court of the temple. And the reason that they're there is to obviously exchange Roman money for Jewish money so that the worshipers could come and they could buy animals, they could buy uh, pigeons, they could buy doves, they could buy goats, uh, whereby they could sacrifice for the atonement uh, of their sin. And as Jesus comes into the temple, uh, he makes a dramatic entrance. Uh, and he does not just ask the money changers uh, and the religious establishment to leave. Uh, because you see, the Pharisees uh, are overseeing all of this business. In fact, history said the Pharisees, just from this exchange alone, would make about $300,000 in American dollars. These religious people... We're taking advantage of worshipers at that moment in a very crucial moment of Passover. They were taking advantage and they were using their power and their money to manipulate people and taking advantage of their desire to have their sins atoned for and they were padding their own pocket. Now, I know this is not what you expected on Palm Sunday. But Jesus, after making this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, doesn't stop anywhere else. He doesn't stop to have coffee. He doesn't stop to have dinner. The Bible says in verse 12, he goes straight to the temple as if to say that my entering into Jerusalem is an entrance of an age of grace. Because you see, the Bible said that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he, he said, I didn't come to destroy the law. He said, I came to fulfill the law. And I believe that Jesus was coming in and he was addressing the religious establishment that was manipulating and taking advantage of and controlling the worshipers of Jerusalem. And he's saying, I want you to understand something is about to change. Can I tell you, on this Palm Sunday 2018, I believe something is about to change. In the realm of the Spirit, something is about to shift. Amen. Just as Jesus came into Jerusalem, how many believe Jesus has walked in to this building on this Palm Sunday, 2018? If you hear me now, I want you to shout amen. I want you to realize the Son of God, amen, that has been alive throughout all of eternity is walking up and down these aisles just as he walked down the street of Jerusalem and they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna. He is walking down this aisle. He is walking down that aisle. He is walking down that aisle. I believe his presence is manifested in this house. He is immutable. He is unchanging. Amen. He is the most consistent prophet that has ever lived and the only one that has died but rose again and never died again. He is the prophet. He is the king. He is deity. He is, amen, the God of all heaven. And he is in this place right now. How many believe it? But as he came into Jerusalem, I believe the dramatic effect he had on the religious establishment is what the Lord is wanting to do in this house. Jesus walks into the temple and he doesn't, and I know, I know, I know sometimes we are commanded as Christians, we are to be quiet, we are to be meek, we are to be lowly, we are to say, excuse me, if you don't mind, pardon me, pardon me, I love you, pardon me. And we just kind of, we kind of, you know, dance on little eggshells and we're afraid to offend anybody and We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings and we just want to make sure everybody feels good. And I don't think Jesus walked into the temple and kind of danced around and kind of him hawed around and said, excuse me, excuse me, but I don't really like what you're doing here. And I think it'd be, no, 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 my friend, Jesus walked in the authority of heaven and he walked in the authority of the Holy Ghost and he looked at the money changers that were taking advantage and manipulating people and he did not ask them uh, he took and the Bible said uh, and he took their wares uh, and he cast it everywhere he took the means by which they were manipulating people and he spread it and he scattered it uh, and he took the tables on which they were doing their religious business uh, and the Bible said that he turned them over he flipped them over And the reason it is not just a physical symbolism, I believe spiritually the Lord is saying, I am taking the manipulation of religion and those that are taking advantage of the innocent and using religion as a means by which to pad their pocket. I am scattering the devices of the religious and I am turning over the tradition. I am turning over the religion. I am turning over the ritualism and I am bringing something brand new that the world has never seen. How many believe it? Shout amen. My God. I came to preach to you this morning that I believe on this Palm Sunday there are those that are still bound by a spirit of ritualism and religion. They come to church but yet inwardly they are not happy. They do what they do but inwardly they are not free. They give in the offering but inwardly they are still amen bound. Amen. They are still bound by a religious tradition. We sing the songs. We give to the poor. We feed the hungry. We clothe the naked. But my friend Jesus came. He said, it doesn't matter what you do. I'm still the way, the truth, and the life. It is not about a tradition. It is not about a religion. It is not about a ritual. It is about the Son of Almighty God. Somebody shout amen. Lest you think that I'm a little harsh I want to say, I love this quote. Robert Capon said, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is the proclamation of the end of religion. Not of a new religion, 
not even the best of all religions. Because if the cross is the sign of anything, it's the sign that God has gone out of the religious business and solved all of the world's problems without requiring a single human being to do a single religious thing. What the cross is actually a sign of is the fact that religion can't do a thing about the world's problems and that it never did work and it never will. I want to tell you, my friend, I'm preaching to somebody this morning that I believe is still bound by religion. Jesus walks into Jerusalem. As I've already said, the most religious city in the world. But yet controlled by the Pharisees. Controlled by those who took the law and used the law as a whipping post People were afraid of what to eat, what not to eat, what to wear, what not to wear. Afraid of what they could do and what they could not do. And having been to Israel seven times, I will say my heart still breaks for the Jewish people because they are still living under the bondage of that law. You can't get a cheeseburger. In Israel. No, you can't. I'm serious. You cannot get a cheeseburger. Because they still say you cannot put meat and dairy together. Based on one scripture that said you will not boil a kid in its own mother's milk. Why do I say that? I say that because Jesus, when he came, he came not to eradicate but rather to fulfill that law so that we could realize my righteousness does not lie in what I do or I don't do. My righteousness lies in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Paul the apostle said, amen, he has become wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He told the Corinthians, he said, He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Can I tell you, I believe there are those listening to me right now, watching me right now, that you are living in fear. You're afraid of what you can do, what you can't do. You're afraid of what you can wear, what you can't wear. Because you have been judged and you have been criticized. You have been looked down on. People have picked you apart based on what they say that you should do. And now you live in fear and you're trying to be good. You're trying to be righteous. And I came as a voice in the wilderness to let you know that Jesus said, you don't have to try. All you need to do is trust and know that I am sufficient to make you righteous in the sight of a holy God. You don't need to live in fear. You need to live in freedom. How many believe it? I said, you need to live in freedom, not fear. John the Beloved said, there is no fear in love. Perfect love, what does it do? It casts out all fear. Hallelujah. You need to be set free from a religious spirit. And again, you say, Pastor, how can religion be a spirit? The Bible said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And I just submit to you, the devil doesn't care if you're not out shooting up drugs and getting drunk carousing and committing gross sins. He doesn't care if you come to church just as long as you don't know the freedom that only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why I give you three things today. Number one, the danger of a religious spirit. Number two, the delusion of a religious spirit. And number three, the deliverance of a religious spirit. 
The danger of a religious spirit, I believe, that this spirit of religion, this spirit of ritualism, is one of the most dangerous spirits you will ever fight in this world. The reason I tell you that is because it was not the prostitute that gave Jesus problems. It was not the publican that gave Jesus problems. It was not the sinner that gave Jesus problems. It was the religious that gave him problems. And can I go so far as to tell you that it was even the religious that eventually crucified and killed the Son of God? Because the Bible says, Matthew 26, that the high priest rent his clothes. He said he spoke in blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, you've heard his blasphemy. What think ye? And they answered and said, he is guilty of death. I want, you to, I want you to put this in your notes. I believe a religious spirit will crucify the work of Christ in your life. A religious spirit will never allow the spirit of Christ to rise up within you because you are so concerned. Wait a minute, I've not gone to the priest. Wait a minute, I've not confessed. Wait a minute, I've not slid the little box and told a man everything. that. Let me tell you, that religious spirit will keep the life that Jesus came to bring from rising up within you. Oh, listen, church. Jesus said, I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. A religious spirit will make you prideful. The scribes and the Pharisees did everything for one reason. And that is to be seen of every other person that, saw, that, that, that was around them. Matthew 23, Jesus said, all the works they do, they do to be seen of men. They break, make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders. Of their garments. They love the uppermost rooms at the feast, the chief seats in the synagogue. They love to be called a man, rabbi, rabbi. They love titles. And I know I'm a little unconventional in this, but I'm not big on titles. I said, I'm just not big on titles. I'm a pastor. Yes, I have my doctorate, but I know that I'm a person and I'm a man and I'm a human. And brother, I don't care if you've got a third degree or a third grade education. I'm on the same level as you are because we both need the grace of God to be saved. These people that walk around thinking, I got to have this title, I got to have that title, I got to be called. No, let me, let me tell you something, brother. Hey, Amen. If you're into titles, uh, that is a sign that you've got a spirit uh, of hypocrisy about you uh, that you think, I can't be known unless I've got a title. Listen, I'm known as a child of the Most High God. And if you want to throw a title on top of that, that's fine. But I've been saved and redeemed by the grace of God, and that's all that I need. Amen. Hallelujah. Causes us to be proud. Jesus said they give in the corner of the streets. They pray in the corner of the streets. Why? To be seen of men. Let me tell you, a religious spirit, we've got to be careful because it causes us to focus more on what we do rather than who we are. A religious spirit gives us a checklist. Got to do this, got to do that, got to do this. And as long as we check all of these things off, amen, then I'm good. Amen. Let me tell you something. It's not about what you do. It's about who you are in Jesus Christ. Amen. The problem with that is we look for ways to be godly without God being the center of our life. We look for ways to appear godly without God being the center of our life. And I'm not saying that we live any life that we want to live, but brother, when Jesus is the center of your life, it's not that you have to be righteous, it's that you are righteous. It's not that you're trying to be good, it's that you are good because of him. Religious spirit causes you to be prideful. It causes you also to be powerless. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and 28, it came to pass, Jesus said, into these sayings that people were astonished at his doctrine. Why? Because he taught them as one having what? Authority and not as the scribes. 
You see, friend, the accumulation of knowledge will never replace the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let me say it again. The accumulation of knowledge will never replace the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I believe we need to have knowledge, but above knowledge, we need to have anointing. Not only did Jesus walk in the full knowledge of the will of God, he walked in the full power of the Holy Spirit. Religion can never cast out a demon. Religion can never heal the sick. Religion can never deliver somebody from oppression. In fact, look at this example in Acts chapter number 19. I want you to see what the enemy thinks about religion. The Bible says in verse 13 that certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus. And they said, look at this, we adjure you by Jesus who Paul preaches. And there were seven sons. Now they used the word, they used the name. And there were seven of them. Sons of Sceva, one of the chief of the priests. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who in the world are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit leaped on them, overcame them, prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Let me tell you, the devil is not scared of religion. You can flash your business card and say, I go to, I go to this church, I'm bishop so-and-so, I'm apostle so-and-so, and the devil is not scared of the name of your church. He's not scared of the title in front of your name. He is not scared even if you say, I adjure you by the Jesus that Lester Summer all preached. The devil is going to laugh at you because knowledge of Jesus will never replace intimacy with Jesus. You can know about him, you can talk about him, but until you know him, you will be powerless and the devil is going to wreak havoc in your life. But brother, the moment you say, I adjure you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the authority of that name comes on you, the devil is going to run squealing like a dog with a tail between its legs. Why? Not because of you, but because of the authority of Jesus, that is within you. Somebody shout amen. Hallelujah. Anybody hear what I'm saying today? I'm just going to just, I'm just going to put it out there. Palm Sunday 2018 is the day that we stop using religion as a badge of honor and we start standing in the presence and the power of Hosanna, Son of God. Hallelujah. Today's the day that you find freedom in him. It'll make you prideful. It'll make you powerless. The worst danger of religion is this, though. Religion will cause you to perish. Jesus said, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. He said, you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twice fold, more the child of hell than yourself. And again, I'm just going to say, we've got to understand, my friend, and please, don't get mad at me for saying this. There is still a heaven but there is still a hell. And hell is full of people that were deceived into thinking that because I came to church and because I dropped a dollar in the bucket that in some way that made me right with God. Listen, my friend, you can come every Sunday and still die lost and go to a devil's hell. You can give in the offering and still die lost and go to a devil's hell because Jesus, there is no other name under heaven whereby you must be saved outside of the name of Jesus. Oh, God. God, let us get away from this religiosity and realize Jesus is the only way that I'm going to make heaven. Amen. That's the danger of religion. 
But number two, the delusion. I read this passage. And look in verse number 10. The Bible said when he came into Jerusalem, all the city was moved. There was electricity. I mean, can you imagine? Here's Jesus riding into Jerusalem. And they're waving the palm branches. They're shouting out, Hosanna. I mean, this city was alive. Everybody was moved. Everybody was excited. But then the phrase stuck out to me. They looked at each other and said, oh, by the way, who is this guy? Huh? Huh? They, even though they were in the most religious spot in the world, did not know who Jesus was. By the way, who is this guy? I believe there are people, they get excited, they feel the electricity, but if Jesus would take on flesh and walk in the back door, they wouldn't have a clue who he is. There are churches that we go through the tradition of a four-set song list. We take the offering. We shake each other's hands. We hug each other's neck. The pastor preaches about 35 minutes. I know I'm long-winded. I'll preach 40. Pastor preaches 35 minutes. We come, we offer about a 10-minute prayer, and then we hustle out the door so we can be first in the line at the Chinese buffet. We want to beat everybody else, and then we do it week after week after week simply because we are locked into a tradition. I'm telling you, church, I've been guilty. I don't want just to go through a service outline. I want the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ to walk into this room and to shake us and to move us and to make us and break us out of a religious mindset that said we got to do this and this and this and that's what constitutes church. Listen, if we never get past song one, but we worship Jesus and magnify him, we've had church. Amen. Hallelujah. My God. There are people that have sit on church pews for decades that have never felt the presence of Jesus in their life. I'm going to go ahead and say it. There are preachers that have preached thousands of sermons but have never felt the anointing of the Holy Ghost. They have delivered a homily. They have delivered a lesson. They have delivered a message. But they have never felt the presence of the Lord. Listen, church, anything that I want, put it all aside if Jesus is the one that is front and center when we come into the house of God. Oh, you need him today. I need him today. We need him today. I, I don't do it often. But every now and again, I will flip on the television through Charismatic Alley, all of the stations. I'll flip through there. And my heart is grieved. Now, there are some great preachers on television, I'm telling you. We've got a program on television, so there's, there are some great preachers. Well, I didn't even mean to say, I'm sorry, I didn't, that came out wrong. My wife is going to finish up for me while my face turns red. But I am grieved how so many ministries have taken the gospel and used it as a means by which to manipulate and control people. Let me tell you, Jesus came 
And he came whether you've got a million dollars or not even a dime to your name. And he came to save you from an everlasting hell and to redeem your life by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm praying that we get back to preaching, amen, not a prosperity gospel, but a pure gospel, a powerful gospel, amen, a gospel that lifts up the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel God wants us to preach. And Paul said if anybody comes preaching any other gospel, let him be accursed is what the Bible said. Because we are training people to think that it's all about the money. It's all about the personality. It's all about the crowd and the number. And we're missing the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I feel him here today, don't you? I believe he's here. Please, please, please don't think by you sitting there that you're going to go to heaven just because you showed up. Please don't think that just because you give your tithe, which I believe we are commanded to do, that you're going to go to heaven just because you put a dollar at the altar. Please don't think that just because you gave toothpaste to somebody that is in need at Hope Ministries, uh, that your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm going to tell you, don't be deceived into thinking that just because your mama was a, was, a, was a Christian and your daddy was a preacher and your grandpa was a Pentecostal man of God, it doesn't matter what they did. you got to know Jesus for yourself. you got to know him for yourself. I'm talking to young people that right now, your mom and your dad are strong believers, but you've been riding on the coattail of daddy for years thinking that it's good enough. No, it's not good enough. You've got to come and you've got to know Jesus yourself. I love my kids. I will do absolutely anything for my children. But just because I'm a pastor does not make them any better than any other child. They got to know Jesus themselves. The danger of religion, the delusion of religion. I believe we're living in an age of delusion right now. I do. I say that with all love in my heart. I say that with all humility. We are living in an age of delusion. And, and Paul prophesied the day would come. He said there will come a day in which they have a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. And that's why number three, I want you to see the deliverance from the spirit of religion. Go back to our text, if you will. When Jesus came in, verse number 12, he cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple. He overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Jesus didn't tolerate this religious spirit. He drove it out. What did Jesus tell? Hear me now. Give me five more minutes. What did Jesus tell the church in Revelation? He said, I've got someone against you. You know why? Because you tolerate Jezebel to teach in your church. You cannot complain about that which you tolerate in your life. You cannot tolerate a religious spirit. No, Jesus, he turned the table over. I believe the reason he did is because he is showing them there's no need to sell any more goats. There's no need to sell any more animals. There's no need to sell any more pigeons or doves. You know why? 
because I'm about to make the last sacrifice that is ever needed for the redemption of the sins of mankind. There's no more blood that's got to be spilled. There's no more sacrifice that has got to be made because the Bible said that neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ through the eternal spirit offered himself purge your conscience from dead works and serve the living God. Friend, I'm telling you, deliverance from this religious spirit is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You don't have to confess your sin to me. I can't save you, but Jesus can. I believe... <laughs> I believe when he came in, and I'm closing. I believe when he came in and he turned those tables over and he wrecked that place. He did it in front. He did it in front of the religious establishment. Because he was telling the priest, sorry. There's no more need for you. Your job is done. Yeah. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. He's telling the priest, your job is done. You know why? Because I am about to come the great high priest who was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. He was tempted at all points like as we are yet without sin. And now the Bible said we can come boldly unto the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. There's one priest. His name is Jesus. I said there's one priest. His name is Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. He is standing in the heavenlies. He is standing in the heavenlies. He hears your prayer. He hears your cry. He sees your need. He's reaching now to you. Oh, hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Give him a shout of praise in this house. Lift up your hand. Lift up your voice. And give him a praise. Hallelujah.